we didn't really know what it was called back when I started playing, but competitive video gaming, which is what I would call it if it wasn't called esports. I think I played uh, Quake Online in 95, like what we would call esports now, probably 2002, I think, was the first time I commentated. And we back then, obviously, we did radio. We didn't do, we didn't do TV or stream, so, yeah. It's pretty easy for me. Um, I'm a super competitive guy. Um, I loved sports when I was at school. Uh, I was always super competitive, wanted to win. I was very lucky that I had video games in my life in the 80s when I was growing up. So through my teenage years, I played a lot of video games at home in my spare time. And it was a, it was a sort of trade-off, you know? My mum would be like, hey, go outside. You should be getting some air, some fresh air. Go and play football. And so I would go out so that I could come home and have a couple of hours on the computer. And then my mum would be okay with that. So. Um, you know, even back in the 80s, we were having the same kind of issues that, that a lot of people, young people, are having now. Transferring from playing video games at a decent level, at a, a relatively high level when I was young, into commentating and hosting, there are different challenges, but it's that drive to want to be the best. So you constantly want to learn, you constantly want to practice, you want to do better preparation, you want to learn more about a game, uh, you, you just want to expand your knowledge about what you're doing. And that, that's not just Dota or CS or Quake or Unreal Tournament. It's, it's more about how can I be a better host? How can I be a better commentator? What can I learn? What can I learn from other people? So I guess I'm competitive, even though it's not really a competitive job. Does that make sense, I guess? So yeah, I think that's probably what keeps it alive in the sense of why am I still involved? But it's more, it's more about the fact that I, it's just passion for, for the games. You know, I love video games. I love the fact that we've built this industry between us from, um, from nothing. And I feel like I was a small part of that growing up through it. And I just want to see where the journey ends. And it, and it changes, right? So you never know. Like today it's great, tomorrow we don't know. Could be bad, but probably going to be good. And I just want to see how far esports can go. So I, I fell into commentating by mistake. A friend of mine in 2002 said, hey, you're English, you should commentate. Okay, well, commentate on what? And he was like, on, on Unreal Tournament. Uh, okay, that's weird, is that something people do? And he was like, yeah, people do it in Quake all the time, you should totally do it. And I just gave it a go, and I, I was a good player at the time in Unreal Tournament, so it was fairly easy to kind of be fairly critical of the players doing things that I thought weren't very good. And I think I might have had like 20 on viewers or something, or 20 listeners back then. And it just grew. It grew over a, a, a couple of years. Uh, and then I started going to events. And so it just snowballed. And I didn't really have any plans, even at that point, where I was thinking, hey, I could, I could do this for a job. I could make a living from this. Because my, my background is financial law. Um, and I had a good job, earning good money. And so I didn't really feel like it was something I wanted to go and do or even needed to do. But then in 2005, uh, I got made redundant and they gave me some money to, to survive. And that allowed me and my, my girlfriend at the time to be very supportive and see what I could do. So I spent the year traveling in 2005 and went all over the world doing different events. And at that point we weren't paid at all. So we were doing this because we loved doing it. And we were also in a, in a similar kind of way to now, we were trying to prove to tournaments that they should have us at their tournaments. We were trying to prove the concept of commentary alongside video games, which then entertained people, which then got viewership, that then got people to the events and made them more money. So I guess you could say we were kind of pioneers in that way and that no one really knew. I mean, today it sounds ridiculous, right? If you had the international and there were no commentators, people would go mad. They would be like, what the hell is going on? There'd be uproar. And, and yet actually 11 years ago, we didn't do that. That wasn't a thing. Yeah, I think a lot of people don't understand that. I think they look at it from the outside in and they go, wow, what a great life you lead. You get to travel all over the world. You get to go to all these great events. You get paid good money. You get to interact with all these players, these famous players and these big teams and everything else. But what they don't see is the sacrifice on the other side of it. And a lot of commentators and hosts and talent in, uh, in esports do have to make lots of sacrifices. I mean, amongst those are, you know, I can't remember the last time I had a steady girlfriend. It's very hard when you're traveling for three, four months. I've been on the road since April, for instance, and I think I've seen my girlfriend twice for two weeks in that period. So that's a lot of pressure and not everyone will put up with that, you know, and I don't blame people for not putting up with that. But likewise, stress on family. Um, I think it's safe to say that my, my relationship, uh, my long-term relationship with uh, the mother of my children and my children has suffered because of esports. 
it's not as straightforward. But that said, I don't think it's a difficult life either. I don't want people to think, oh, poor Red Eye, you know, he, he suffers and he, he has to make these sacrifices. But it's absolutely true. You do have to make sacrifice if you want to be good at something, whether that's hosting, casting, playing, whatever it might be. So, and, and this is no different. I think the, the thing with the, the move to stadiums has, uh, has given us like an extra set of goosebump moments. You have these moments that happen in games and you're, you're genuinely thrilled by the moment. But then when they happen at a big tournament with big prize money and they happen in a stadium, all of that combined means that you just experience something that is almost unique. I, I can only think of something else in other sports that you would experience the same, same kind of feeling of camaraderie and the fact that you're there with all these other fans of the same thing that you love doing and you love watching. So at the International we had, a, we had an incredible moment between EG and Ehome where EG came back from a game that they should never have won against Mega Creeps, which has never happened at the International ever before. And I was in the VIP booth at the time with about 15 of the talent who weren't working that particular match. And we were going absolutely crazy. I nearly lost my voice in there shouting. And I then suddenly became very aware of the whole stadium was on its feet and cheering and screaming and shouting and chanting. And, and then the players jump up as they win and they celebrate. And it, that's, that's magical. I mean, you, those are genuinely amazing moments in esports. Uh, it's difficult actually, preparation. Preparation is, is one of my keys to success. It's one of the things that I've, I've majored on over the last few years. And in fact, probably the last eight or nine years. I realized very early on that actually, the only time I get really nervous is when I'm not aware of what's going on or I don't understand the tournament or I don't have enough information about a team or a player. Because I know that makes me nervous or less confident, I'll prepare super hard. Because I know that if I prepare well, I'll very rarely feel scared or nervous about a tournament. So that's partly the reason that I will come across quite confident when I'm doing stage or whether I'm doing a panel or whether I'm commentating. So for the international, it starts weeks, weeks ahead, absolutely weeks ahead, and it will be hundreds of hours of preparation, watching videos, watching old games, watching qualifiers, uh, working with statisticians to figure out milestones, who's coming up for a major event, who's about to play the hundredth game for a team or a thousandth game in Dota or whatever it might be. So relatively easy as a stage host. As a panel host though, much harder, like weeks and weeks ahead. I, I genuinely thought when I was doing it back in 2002 to 2005 that it could grow. Particularly in 2005 when we had the CPL World Tour, I'd started doing TV, we'd started doing streaming online, very basic video streaming online. And I sort of felt like, hey, this could be something that really grows and could be amazing one day and, and could rival other sports and could be big on TV. And I've had moments throughout that career, CGS being one of them in 2007, eight, where you sort of think, wow, we've arrived. And then unfortunately what happens in esports or what has happened in the past is that it goes up and it goes down and it goes up and it goes down and then it goes up a lot and then goes down a lot and it goes up even more and comes down even more. So the difference for me has been that the last five years have been much more stable and we've grown every year for the last five years and that didn't happen throughout the 2000s. It was much more up and down and if we lost a tournament that was a huge deal for esports. It was a massive blow. These days if we lose a tournament there's five more that spring up around it anyway, right? I think, did I think it could be as big as today, doing stadiums with 20,000 people in and going out to tens of millions of people at home? Probably not. I probably didn't think that back then, but I definitely thought it could be much bigger. Yeah, I think esports is here to stay now. Um, I think if you looked at eight, nine years ago when we lost CGS, you could have said, wow, that's a big blow to esports and it may be could have killed esports off, but we don't have that anymore. We have a much healthier scene. We have a lot more people involved. We have a wider, diverse selection of advertisers, sponsors. They're all involved now than we've ever had before. And when you look at the big companies involved, we've got Amazon involved with Twitch. We've got Google involved with YouTube Gaming. Uh, we've got MTG taking over DreamHack and ESL. Uh, we've got MLG going off to Activision. It's very hard to imagine a world where all of those would suddenly implode and not make any money and then decide actually esports is a load of rubbish and we don't want to do it anymore. 
Uh, alongside that, you've got people like Coca-Cola, American Express, uh, Red Bull, Monster. They're all involved now at a very high level and putting a lot of money into esports. Again, very difficult to see why they would suddenly stop doing that if it's proved successful for them on a market basis, which obviously has. They're reaching the demographic, the target demographic that they want. I, I think esports is here to stay for sure. In what capacity, we just don't know. I'm sure it will have its peaks and troughs as we go through the next 10 years, but overall, I think it'll be much bigger than it is now in 10 years. Uh, just, you know, if you're passionate about this esports stuff and uh, you love doing what you're doing, just carry on doing it. Never let anyone tell you you can't achieve dreams, because you can. Thank you, Paul. Thank you.